by now, uh, everyone in the world uh, knows Pope Francis gave a wide-ranging interview to Civilta Cattolica, which is a Jesuit a journal in uh, Rome, and it was then uh, simultaneously published by, I think it was 16 Jesuit-sponsored journals from around the world. Um, and as we've come to expect, every time this pope speaks, there's a, a bit of a media frenzy. Judging from the headlines in the New York Times and on CNN, you'd think that um, there was a revolutionary maverick pope leading this um, recalcitrant institution you know, into the modern world. Well, I would um, urge everyone to take a deep breath and uh, prayerfully, or at least thoughtfully, consider what Francis actually has said, because I think it's an extraordinary interview and is in its own way quite revolutionary, but not the way the, uh, the press um, has it. Uh, I think the interpretive key is the uh, answer he gave to the first question. The interviewer simply said to him, who is Jorge Mario Bergoglio, the Pope's given name? And he said, after a substantial pause, the Pope said, I'm a sinner who's been looked upon by the gaze of Christ. And I think that's an extraordinary answer to give. Uh, it was not just for rhetorical effect. It's coming out of a very deep spirituality. He names himself as a sinner who has been addressed by grace. That, I would submit to everyone, is the heart of the Catholic thing. That's the gospel, if you want. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all sinners without exception. But we've been addressed by grace. Before we get to abortion, gay marriage, birth control, all the issues that we usually talk about, long before we get to any of that, we have to start with this moment of encounter between a sinner and amazing grace. And I think what he keeps saying in this interview is keep our priorities clear. It's very interesting how he uh, made reference to Caravaggio's masterpiece, the uh, conversion of St. Matthew. You find it in that wonderful church of uh, St. Louis of the French in Rome. Christ addresses uh, Matthew. He, he puts his, his beckoning hand out to him, and the light falls on St. Matthew. And Matthew gestures to himself as if to say, like, how would you possibly be calling someone like me? That's the moment. That's the moment of encounter. Think, too, of Giussani who's very influential on Pope Francis, the moment of encounter with Christ between a sinner who knows it. There's Matthew in, in the midst of his tax collector's work who's addressed by the light of grace. That is the heart of the Catholic thing. Now, we'll get to all the other issues you want to talk about, but if you forget that central moment, you've forgotten everything. And that also, I think, sheds light on one of the more controversial remarks he made, namely that the church is not a little chapel for a handful of people, but is meant for the whole world. Well, this goes right back to the Bible, of course, but coming right up through Vatican II. Paul VI, in the wake of Vatican II, said the church doesn't have a mission. The church is a mission. The church's whole reason for being is to draw everybody into that moment of encounter so that every sinner can see the face of, of Christ's mercy and can bathe in his light. We're not like a little chapel for the morally perfect. God help us. I mean, how many people are morally perfect? Well, nobody. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're not a little chapel for those who, um, you know, are living the moral life perfectly. Rather, we're meant to be a community that gathers in the whole world to look at the face of Christ. I think the missionary evangelical side of the church uh, is being strongly emphasized there. And then in light of these two moves, we might understand the most controversial uh, statement he makes. I wanted to read it so I get the wording just right. The Pope said, The church sometimes has locked itself up in small things and in small-minded rules. The most important thing is the first proclamation. Jesus Christ has saved you. Well, see, there it is. What comes first? Before you get to moral rules or liturgical prescriptions or, or spiritual programs, what comes first? Jesus Christ has saved you. That's the look that St. Matthew got. That's Bergoglio who says, I'm a sinner who's been looked upon by grace. That comes first, and then we get in time to the rules and regulations and specificities of the life. 
What you don't want to do, and of course I've argued this before as well, what you don't want to do is lead with the rules. If you do that, in our postmodern culture, all the defenses go up. Nobody wants to be told that they're, they're living their life the wrong way. When you lead with that, you tend not to get a very good reaction from our postmodern culture. Rather, the Pope says, lead with grace. Lead with the moment of encounter with the Jesus Christ who offers you salvation. Now, I might have offered this analogy before and perhaps it's a little bit trite, but uh, it helps me. If you're trying to draw a little kid into the beauty of baseball, what you do is you bring him to the stadium. You show him people playing the game. You show great hitters and pitchers and runners. He maybe takes in the, the smells and sights and sounds of, of the stadium. You get him into the lyricism and poetry of baseball, which in turn will lead him to want to play, which in turn will lead him to understand the rules from the inside. What you don't do is begin with the infield fly rule. You don't begin with the rule book of baseball, because that will probably just turn somebody off, or they won't find it very compelling. Rather, draw them into the poetry of the game, and then they will come to inhabit the rules from the inside. I think that's precisely what the Pope is arguing here. That in our situation, especially today, to begin with the rules is a non-starter. Will we get there? Yes. He's not saying, I think if you read this, this text carefully, he's not saying these are unimportant. Let's jettison the rules. Who needs all this small-minded stuff? It's a question of prioritization and pastoral strategy. I think that's a point that was often missed by the, uh, the media as they had their first uh, coverage of this. Um, the image that I thought was the greatest in the interview, and it's, it's part of this Pope's unique ability to find really telling and memorable phrases. Think of, um, you know, the pastor has to smell like his sheep. Or think famously when he was in Rio and he talked about making a mess. He has a, a gift for this kind of lively um, turn of phrase. Well, in this one we have, the church is a field hospital. It's very telling of this field hospital. It's a place where gravely wounded people come as they leave the battlefield of life. See, what are we living in now, especially in the West? We're living in this postmodern culture that has left so many people spiritually wounded. They're adrift in this sea of moral relativism. They're cut off from God. Look at the aggressive new atheism that just dismisses God as a medieval superstition. They've lost their way, you know. And more than that, as Chesterton said, they've lost their address. <laughs> Chesterton said, people have always lost their way, but the point is now they've lost their address. They don't even know where they're supposed to be going. Spiritually speaking, these are people who are gravely wounded. So, as the Pope said, if someone comes gravely wounded from a battlefield into a field hospital, you don't check their pulse and their cholesterol levels. You address these fundamental problems. So it goes in the life of the church, especially today. If we're a field hospital, we have to be addressing first these fundamental points of spiritual woundedness in people. And I think, again, he's scoring us for a certain preoccupation with the smaller issues when the great issues have to be addressed so immediately. Now, I love this text. I think it's a beautiful text. I would say this by way of criticism. Uh, I would share with a number of people the critique that at times, the Pope's language, again, gives the impression, I'm not saying he's saying it directly, but give the impression that some very good people who have fought the good fight for many years, especially on the, let's say, pro-life front, that they can seem to be characterized as, you know, obsessed with small-minded rules and all this. I, I sympathize with those who say, come on, don't throw, you know, good culture warriors here under the bus. And again, I don't think the Pope is by any means saying that directly, but some of the language might give that impression, and I think that's, that's regrettable. But at the end of the day, and looked at in some, I think it's a very powerful spiritual um, testament. Not an encyclical, and maybe that's a good thing for people today, you know, who might be, be put off by something as formal as an encyclical. This interview, and it is more personal, and it's more wide-ranging, and it's more um, associative, might draw people today in, in a way that a formal encyclical would not. And I think um, what they'll find if they look at it carefully and prayerfully is a very powerful articulation of what stands at the very heart 
of a Catholic thing. 